Hey y'all, it's Kira, John, Rachel, Caitlin, Dave, Hunter, Jake, Clara, and you're and listening, listening to, to the, the PureCast, Pure featuring the BA reps, your one-stop shop for everything UMTAD. Hey y'all, hello, hello, hello. Hi, friends. <laughs> <laughs> it's Kira. <laughs> and it's John. And we're here <laughs> on this day, this very significant day. And big day. yeah, we're just going to like take a breath today. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so breathe, breathe with us. Breathe in and breathe out. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't my intention. <laughs> okay. No, it just, it's perfect. No, it's, this is like room noise. <laughs> We're keeping okay, it. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so wow, thank you for song. taking that breath from <laughs> breath yes. of us all. <laughs> Let's go ahead and start with some Uptown updates. All right. If you're not breathing, at least you're hopefully smiling. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, so some UMTAD updates, y'all. So Sonia and Laverne have a wonderful class popping up. So here's a little bit of uh, a nice little question to spark some interest here. Do you want to heal anxiety or open your mind with people in theater? Are you interested in exploring the healthy body through physical but socially distance tactics mm-hmm. like clowning? Well, this spring, the Department of Theater Arts and Dance offers a pair of exciting classes led by Professor Sonia Kuptenek and teaching a specialist, Laverne Seifert, to uh, research and devise a performance about the history of pharmacy and drugs as healing slash poison and how drug taking has been represented in popular culture. So the classes um, TH5950 and TH5117 uh, meet together in Rarig on Fridays from 9 a.m. to noon throughout the spring semester. Um, they imagine the course and performances they'll create as a journey uh, or a trip, <laughs> asking <laughs> how Ouch. drugs and drug tanking um, create health and wellness as well as abuse and toxicity. So things you're going to explore is like what myths and stories have we told and what can we retell? Um, so you mentioned some mushroom stories at the ba town hall so spicy yes <laughs> or maybe maybe sweet i don't know are mushrooms can mushrooms be sweet i don't know i don't know either. couldn't tell you i, I don't like know i don't think i've ever an earthy yeah I, just yeah. a little i get it yeah i get it i have never either though so i don't say i've never had a i've never had a mushroom before no either psychedelic or regular <laughs> <laughs> wait what <laughs> That's not what I thought you meant. That's no, so I've never, never had any of mushrooms before in my life. Okay. But okay. Well, regular <laughs> mushrooms are definitely like like a like a earthy kind of like. Okay. Okay. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, y'all can sign up for interviews with Laverne and Sonia to see if you want to take a trip with them through the Pharmacon. <laughs> Check your inbox or shoot us an email and we'll go ahead and forward it to you. For sure. And I know they mentioned that they're definitely looking to expand that through the programs and departments. So you do not have to be a BA at all by any means. Um, Also, in another exciting class coming from a BA faculty is Kim Longy's Physical Approaches class this spring. So she is planning on exploring Shakespeare's The Scottish play. <laughs> and so the idea is that it's going to be, can I say that? Can I say the actual word? No, but go ahead. <laughs> okay, great. So it's going to be Macbeth with two performers in a bunker with a bunch of screens. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And so the idea is that Macbeth's reality is mediated by the media and she is really wanting to explore truth versus lies. We know a lot about truth versus lying in the media today. Wow. Um, and Jeez. so, <laughs> I know, no yeah. shade. No shade. Okay. Actually, yeah, a lot of shade. But, okay. We are also, they're planning to explore characters via media mind. So, it's going to be mm. taught as an in-person, in-person uh, slash virtual hybrid. Woo-woo. That's the plan. All right. And also make sure to check out Chelsea's creative collab. Um, So this is Chelsea Warren. Um, Her collab is all about one person shows. You are your full team. You're the performer, writer, designer, builder, all of the above, dramaturg, if you will. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
<laughs> Foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so she'll be um, doing tabletop shows, toy theater performed for the camera. Um, and it's going to be a possible collab for showcases with Jungle Theater. She's been in talks of um, them possibly getting them in the windows, those one person shows. So that might be super cool and a fun way to go ahead and uh, get some social distancing performance going on. Beautiful. Another reminder to get your tickets for I With Things Newborn, which is going to be housed in a live theater, but is super safe and well thought out. So the show, um, again, is being put on by Madeline Wall, who's a recent UMN grad, and Renee Schwartz, who is a current UMN student. Oh, and them. I know, I know, they're both so great. And so the play will be 45 minutes long, and it's taking place at the Off Leash Art Box, which is down by Minnehaha. And this weekend's your last chance. They already opened this last weekend, and I am so excited to go next weekend. I really, really mm -hmm. just can't wait to see it. So get your tickets now. Jump on them before, before it's too late. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. All right. Now, for some, some slight BFA updates here. So if you have not already, make sure that you're checking out the the little, the different Guthrie class uh, Instagrams. They're all pretty wild. <laughs> They're all pretty super fun. Specifically, UMN Guthrie 2023, living their best life right now. You can see them in their Halloween costumes as <laughs> BFA <laughs> faculty and some some sexy uh, Billy Shakespeare as you see <laughs> 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 if you ever wanted to see that. Um, as well as some casting photos, Harry Potter, Hunger Games, they Miz. I mean, like, you know, you get to really know the, them in depth, up, down, left, and right. You know, you just really make sure that you go ahead and uh, check that out. It's going to be a fun time for you. So, For sure. It's bringing me so much life right now this week. All right. Also, we wanted to highlight, so Queen Hunter, the dance peer, which uh, we all know and love by now for sure, um, has started a dance peer committee, and it's made up of Aubrey Clark, Philip Homas, um, Ansel Langmead, and Alex Schultz. And they are just out here being an incredible resource for mm. all of you. And so if you have any questions, concerns, wonderings, they are so more than willing to um Bring their bring your thoughts to Hunter and to faculty. Um, so definitely reach out to them. And right now they're currently working on rehearsal policies for intimacy and consent and sexual harassment. And not only is this a dance department endeavor, this is actually kind of a collaboration between all of the programs within UMTAD. So Doug's creative collab in the Theater BA that just finished up this in the last couple of weeks, put together this super thorough document that was very much inspired by the Chicago Theater Standards, which I know the BFA program is also um, trying to implement within their own rehearsal prop policies. And so there's definitely more information and elaboration and updates to come with all of that. But we're excited to share that that is something that we're working on and will be um, definitely a goal for this year to complete. Yes. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for, the moment we've been foreshadowing <laughs> since the beginning, one time. <laughs> and last episode. And last yes, episode. Yes, yes. Yes. True. 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 If you don't know, y'all go know Talvin Wilkes, Wilkes <laughs> by the end of this today. So Talvin is a playwright, director, and dramaturg. His plays that he's written include um, Todd the Boy Todd, The Trial of Uncle S&M, Bread of Heaven, An American Triptych, um, Jimmy and Lorraine, Amusing, and as I can remember it, um, with Carmen Dillabot, sorry, Carmen uh, Lavalade, there we are. Uh, directorial projects include the world or regional premiere productions of Udu by um, Seko Sunyata, uh, The Love Space Demands by Intizaki uh, Shange, the Obi Awards as Adelka Award winning The Shaniko Chronicles by Stephanie Berry, The Spread of Earth by Harrison David Rivers, The White Card by Claudia Rankin, um, The Peculiar Parrot by Liza. Um, Jesse Peterson, and The Ballad of Emmett Till and Benevolence by Ifa Baeza. So quite a few things. <laughs> yes. He is a co-writer, <laughs> co-director, dramaturg um, for Ping Chan's ongoing series of Undesirable Elements and Kaleidoscope, Adventures in Pre- and Post-Racial America, which did uh, also pop up here in our UNTED department last year. Um, he also mm -hmm. served as a dramaturg for six collaborations with the 
Phoebe Miller Company, uh, Going to the Wall, The Bessie Award winning Verge, Necessary Beauty, A History in the Making Room, and Landing Place, for which he received a 20, uh, not 2006, but 2006. <laughs> um, he is currently an assistant professor in the Theater Arts and Dance Department, University of Minnesota Twin Cities, and writing a book titled Testament, 40 Years of Black Theater History in the Making. From 1964 to 2004, which are solid years, I have to say. Those are like those are like pretty, pretty uh, pivotal years in Black mm. history, if y'all know. Um, so definitely something that's very interesting as well. But here we are, Talvin. Hello. Hey, hello. Talvin. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Great. How are you doing? Oh, I'm. You know, I'm still a bit under the weather, but I'm okay. I'm working my way through. So. Oh, are you are you experiencing some sickness? Uh, a little bit, but you know, no no COVID alarm. So okay, good. <laughs> good. Just leave that alone. <laughs> good news. Yes, indeed. How are your workshops going? Are you still doing those this week? Um, with uh, Little Buck. Yeah, and yeah. Buck, no, those that ended uh, a week ago. Okay. Yeah, it was a series of, it was a six day workshop. We divided it into two parts, two days in between. So, you know, it went well. We did our uh, report out to the Apollo and they were all pleased. So very exciting. Uh, it actually did occur during the week we were supposed to originally premiere. So mm. that was a little bittersweet, but hopefully next year at the same time, um, We'll be at the Apollo. We'll see. That's amazing. For anyone who maybe doesn't know about the project you've been working on, do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Sure. And I guess I'm assuming we've begun. Is that right? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, I was, you know, it was a little, it was a little low key. I was, I yeah. was expecting the hello. hello. <laughs> how, I get it now. That's how the peer cast begins. But by the time you mm -hmm. get to the mm -hmm. guest, mm -hmm. it's a little further along. Uh, right, anyway, right on. Uh, <laughs> Slide right on in, right on in. <laughs> <laughs> and hi, John. Hello. Uh, Yes. Um, so I've, I've been working with uh, John Boogs and Little Buck, or Buck. Uh, John Boogs is a pop and locker uh, extraordinaire, and Buck is a Memphis Jukin uh, extraordinaire. And um, uh, they brought me on to work on their last piece. They have a company called Movement Art Is. Uh, and they develop a piece called Love Heals All Wounds that had been touring, and then they were developing it further. And so they brought me on as a dramaturg to just collaborate and think about the storytelling and the further development of the piece. And now they're they're moving even further. They're in a the process of de potentially developing it as a Broadway opportunity. So that's all very exciting. Uh, mm -hmm. But the piece, but the version of it that I, that I worked on premiered uh, a year ago and is featured in the new series on Netflix called Move. So it's the opening mm. episode and sort of documents the process of that making. I make a little cameo. You'll see me a little bit. I'm in a little, I'm in a little cypher. So I, I make a little appearance. So, uh, but so this cool. project, this new project is a commission from uh, the Apollo Theater, they're doing a series of commissions uh, to commemorate the Harlem Renaissance. And so we started on the project a year and a half ago, really, developing it um, in thinking about uh, artists of the Renaissance and then artists today and the history uh, inside of that uh, centennial arc. So that is what we're working on. Mm. That's, That's really exciting. It yeah. really is no, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very, as, as I say, it's, 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 it's how I remain youthful. Uh, <laughs> but no, it's really been an incredible honor to working with the, the two of them. They're incredible creators and performers. And, you know, the one, of th one of the things I love about them is that they really know the history and lineage of, of the art form, uh, you know, the history of breaking, the history of Memphis juking. They know their pioneers and their mentors. And they really do celebrate them inside of the work that they do. So when these forms, you know, get appropriated in a way and they appear on 
sort of world of dance and so you think you can dance mm -hmm. and with no real sense <laughs> of the original pioneers or the communities where the dance forms you know sort of originate uh to see that the two of them are so committed uh even inside of all of their success uh to pay homage and tribute to their to their mentors and to the pioneers of the art form uh it's really impressive and inspiring so i've enjoyed learning uh of course it's always a collaborative process uh, becoming more and more informed in my street dance vernacular yeah <laughs> that's so cool and you said that so everyone was in la were they all in the studio together you mentioned uh well actually they they were in different places so okay. uh john bugs lives in uh, las vegas and um, Buck lives in LA. So we were, mm -hmm. so I was here, you know, it was all virtual. So mm -hmm. I was here mm -hmm. and uh, you know, they were in their respective homes and both had access to studios. Uh, so there was some dance performance uh, exploration that occurred, but really we, we were still, we were allowing ourselves since we have a whole year of further development, we were allowing ourselves mm. to re, investigate, reinterrogate, uh, think about earlier concepts, which initially was uh, a type of, of migration story. We were really thinking about the great migration and infusion of, you know, African Americans, you know, coming from South to North at that time and the impact that it had, uh, you know, in Harlem, sort of in the early 1900s and sort of the culmination in sort of all those art forms that flourished uh, during the period that we call the Harlem Renaissance. That was a sort of an original idea, but uh, this time around we had an opportunity to really think about what does it be mean to be making work in this current moment? And mm. uh, so the ideas now live inside of a COVID, George Floyd, uh, you know, activist Black Lives Matters reality. And although that was the pre-reality as well, so that was part of the exploration, but now we really felt compelled to think about the context of politics and um, came out with some really great new ideas. I just sort of wrote a piece about it in, in this notion that we're thinking about exploitation and appropriation and gentrification and the impact that these ideas have on how we understand uh, black art forms and the originators of those forms and uh, paying homage uh, into claiming one's history and one's artistry. So now the piece is a bit more of a time travel and thinking about the struggles of Black artists and Black artists in, especially working through a type of, you know, st uh, street dance vernacular, our, our, our dance vernacular, vernacular dance concept, and how often those forms are not seen as classic forms and are always sort of challenged uh, until they are co-opted are often appropriated by certain institutions and then suddenly there's an established modality and form that then seems mm -hmm. to dismiss and deny uh, the genius of the originators of the form so you know we're working through all of that and how that <laughs> is perpetual and how we see it travel in time even to you know to to the two of them telling their current story in the way that they feel because of TikTok and because of instagram and the access to dance form you can appropriate a form without making a commitment to the community mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and that that notion of that's still happening and that people are making, you know, buku bucks, so to speak, on, you know, someone else's um, artistry uh, becomes quite problematic and that's historical. And so now we're navigating between understanding that idea uh, in the early era of what we consider to be the Renaissance, Harlem Renaissance era, uh, actually framed as the new Negro Renaissance or the new Negro movement of that time. Um, and then how they deal with those types of that type of exploitation 
mm. on the international dance scene today. So suddenly we kind of got some politics into our <laughs> reality and uh, working on the project. And that became incredibly exciting. And they were doing some original writing now and deep dive research, which of course is always my thing, you know, the <laughs> drama that drives the collective collaboration uh, was really very exciting. So we, you know, we only met four hours a day, but we spent the, the rest of our time uh, doing research and building out our archive and generating work and, and doing this kind of historical mashup between then and now. Um, so we're, we're excited about where we got to in the workshop and what we think the piece uh, mm -hmm will say once it arrives in 2021 hey, uh, hey. The goal is the plan yeah so there more maybe more than you you asked for but that's more about the project and a kind of a sense of you know how i am striving to remain engaged as a generative artist in this moment <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, never too much. That's so, I mean, yeah. that's, a, that's a great point right now of um, when everything's so accessible right now through social media, the um, ability to exploit artistry is just kind of so accessible also, which is right. really just a, wow. Yeah, yeah. I think especially it's, in, oh no, go on, John. I was just say, I think it's just very interesting how the idea of, or the, like the point that you made with, um, how there doesn't need to be a commitment to the community when you are mm -hmm. on this sort of social media. I think it's really interesting because social media almost paradoxically can like also create that opportunity for people to have a commitment to these communities that they are typically, you know, wouldn't necessarily find themselves in, you know, just, just um, by vicinity. And so I think, I think it's almost like there's a whole nother, another level of like, just like, is it purposeful? Like, you know, like, I feel like there's the idea that like, oh, it's just appropriative because like, they just didn't know, like, they just kind of scooped it up real quick, but they can now, like, you very much so can know, like, it's at the, at the palm of your hand, like, you can literally know at any point in time where the things originate from. So. Right. No, that, you know, that's, that's a, that's a great point. And that becomes what is purposeful, I think, mm -hmm. in, in our yeah. advocacy. Um, in thinking about artistry and, and giving due recognition to the originators of the, of, of the form. Mm -hmm. And, and they're, you know, and these two artists are really committed to that. Uh, and you, you see it in the work and you see what they're trying to do. And you see that through all of their success, they're also trying to support uh, the artists with whom they work and also uh, the artists who may not have received the same level or kind of recognition. So, it really is a part of their uh, activism. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Hey, Telvin, how did you begin your dramaturgy work? Is that kind of how you entered the theater space? Um, actually, no. Dr dramaturgy as a practice, uh, as a form of income, uh, came... <laughs> You know, as we say, dramaturgy is always in the room. It's always an engaged idea. But naming myself a dramaturg and really uh, committing to that um, really came later. It didn't really, uh, I didn't really put that mantle on officially until mm -hmm. I was collaborating with a wonderful postmodern choreographer by the name of B.B. Miller and the B.B. Miller, mm -hmm. Miller Company, um, starting to work with her in the late 90s. Um, and then that evolved in, uh, you know, a 15 year collaborative history. Um, so that's where I think I officially put the mantle on, but I had already earlier worked with um, a lot of uh, choreographers working with uh, poets and jazz musicians and sort of blending this idea of directorial practice and dramaturgical practice. Uh, I worked with Lori Carlos early on in her collaboration with uh, Marlies Shearby, who had a dance company called Moving Spirits Dance Theater. And Marlies Shearby is of rent choreographer fame. Uh, so it was sort of working through a whole generation of artists, I would say, in the mid 90s, uh, collaborating with spoken work artists and poets like Carl Hancock Rux, 
uh, and Sekou Sunti Atta, they were also at that time working with urban bush women and other dancers and choreographers, uh, that I really began to establish this notion of a dramaturgical collaborator, um, that I was often not always directorial in the room, but I was conceptual, I was a contributor, uh, especially in my uh, collaboration with choreographers. There was always this wonderful role as dramaturg in the room, and that became a very rich and established period of uh, dance making, which was not necessarily an expected world that I thought I was venturing into, because um, my prior history had been as playwright and then as a director. Um, but all of those elements really work together for me because I see myself as a generative, uh, collaborative director, writer, and dramaturg rooted in uh, my training during my undergraduate years with uh, artists from Joseph Chankin's, uh, Jake Chankin's Open Theater and the Talking Band. Um, so those were my influences that then led me into this vocabulary and language that really allowed me to work with um, artists across the board. So there was a a dramaturgical practice embedded in the work, even though it was not ne necessarily identified as that. So it was very easy for me to label it uh, when I started working with choreographers. So that mm -hmm. you know, that was the that was the evolution of it. Sure. That's awesome. Yeah, you. So you you kind of explained like a little bit of how your work with choreographers like. Um, kind of goes could you go like a little bit more like in detail of like what that process looks like and like what type of i guess like what type of questions you explore because i feel like Absolutely. in my head right now i'm thinking like you talk about like the history of movement and like certain mm -hmm. things like that like i would love to hear a little bit more about that well it's it's fascinating because in my dramaturgy class we have uh, two uh, dramaturgy teams working recently working and observing um, the uh, collaborations in the dance department in UDT mm. as part of their uh, Cal Cole's artist series so we have one dramaturgy team observing uh, Pedro Pablo and the work mm. that they created uh, last week, and then another team observing uh, Minnesota Joe and Mona Lisa in the work that they created, and talking about this very same thing. What is dramaturgical practice inside of a choreographic sort of generative uh, process? What are the questions that you ask? How do you observe work? How do you begin to articulate an understanding of what's happening in the room and what is the language that is being used? How do you document that process? Uh, so those are all the conversations and the techniques and the way that um, I, begin, I began that as an engaged practice. And for me, um, it's not just about theory. It really is uh, a generative collaborative effort that's actually happening in the room. Um, and you're taking on a particular role or task, either as a, a sounding board or an outside eye. You are collecting, articulating language around what is being made at any given time. Uh, many times I am the first translator conceptually of the ideas that are happening in the room, or if we're bringing uh, text or another type of source material, how are we understanding that uh, through generative vocabulary and interpreting those ideas. Uh, and then I'm also involved in thinking about how we're structuring the piece. How, uh, what are the building blocks of a mm. choreographic arc or, uh, or a solo or a sort of development piece that's happening at any given time. And we're constantly thinking about the aesthetics of it, the interpretation of it, the concept in relationship to any of the uh, research materials that we are considering. One of the tasks for the dramaturgy teams were to think about, and they interviewed the artist and really asked them uh, conceptually, what were they thinking about? What did they want to explore? Uh, it was a wonderful module for us because all of these projects are just two weeks. I mean, you know, really incredible things are happening over in Barker sort of this semester. And we've had this very privileged window uh, thanks to 
uh, the team there, Aaron and Laura, uh, in allowing us to uh, interview the artists as well as they've been setting up a, a video cam and a laptop so that we could actually watch rehearsal and then also watch the final filming of the process. And then we're asking those questions that one asks in the room, John, when in collaboration with the choreographer, conceptually the ideas, you know, the, the, the collaborative design aspects and how they uh, reveal a story per se, our concept per se, or what is that engagement between performer and audience as well. So these are the things that I feel a dramaturg navigates inside of a choreographic process um, and can serve, I think, in the basic way as translator, but that just, I think that's reductive. That's not quite the idea, right? When you're in a generative conceptual process, you're really thinking about ideas and aesthetics and concepts. Um, interpretation, all of those things fit into that cauldron um, mm. of, the, of the conversations that are actually happening in the room. Mm. Um, so that is often my role because I'm there right at the very beginning, right? So I'm there in the very first, mm -hmm. you know, concepts of, I mean, working with B.B. Uh, Miller on a particular piece called Landing Place, she wanted to explore an experience that she had in Eritrea in an attempt in trying to translate movement from sort of a Western idea into sort of an Eritrean East African traditional uh, idea and sort of the, 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 the gap in language and communication and the discovery of that became the conceptual idea that she wanted to explore inside of our process. So, you know, I grab onto that and begin to think about, okay, well, what are the funda com fundamental components of this idea? Insider, outsider, foreigner, uh, sort of Afro-rooted <laughs> in a particular way, but not necessarily having the same vocabulary or vernacular. And so then there's this interpretive space, right? Of a, of a similarity, but yet, a lack of a, a of a direct way of communicating. So those became conceptual ideas that we were actually exploring in the dance process. Um, you know, so it's a bit of reconstruction, deconstruction, all of those great ideas <laughs> and how they interrelate with vocabulary and, you know, generative process. So mm. that's my jargon. That's all the language that I'm actually, <laughs> that's actually happening. And and in many ways, you're 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 just kind of collecting these ideas as they evolve and develop, and they are named um, inside of the process. You'd be surprised just how much generative language exists inside of a dance making process. Mm. Um, and it's very exciting to be in the room to actually, as I call it, I call it word capture. Um, mm. capturing of, of, of the language and the shorthand that actually becomes a type of generative uh, process. Mm. Wow. Did that help? Did that say yeah. something? Yeah. I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. I feel like um, lately, I probably within the last five years or so, I've had family members and I, I ushered at a theater and, and guests would come up and ask, you know, what... And, you know, they're looking at their playbill and they're saying, what is this word and what do they do? What, and it's <laughs> dramaturg. And it's it's so cool to to try to, you know, give them the shorthand of what that is because it is, it's so layered and it's so mm -hmm. specific to the project and and all of those ideas, I mean, like you said, are, are so, you know, part of the generative process that it's hard to explain to someone exactly, you know, who that person is you know, without witnessing that process even sometimes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But becoming recognized more and more, it's in the program, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. There, is a, <laughs> there is a recognition, you know, of the importance of uh, the dramaturg. I do get a little credit in the Netflix roll up. There's a Tavern Wolf's dramaturg. So, you know, those become important aspects of the established role and the service that dramaturgs are now doing. And it's, I mean, it is, uh, as a named practice, it is a young practice, especially in mm -hmm. dance, but even recognized 
um, mm -hmm. in the theater. I mean, currently you can get, you know, MFAs or PhDs uh, mm -hmm. in dramaturgy. Uh, um, but, you know, it was rare 20 years ago and then even, mm -hmm. you know, sort of 20 years prior to that. I mean, one of the most exciting things in, in sort of the discovery and thinking about dramaturgy in our department was just how important um, uh, sort of founding professors were inside of our department in establishing the tradition and the use of dramaturgy when Arthur Ballot was in our department and was running the sort of uh, the Office of Dramatic Research out of our <laughs> department and doing some of the most progressive new play development in the country through our department uh, <laughs> in the 60s and sort of early 70s. So you can, you know, look up Arthur Ballad and you can find a whole series of incredible uh, new plays. He has a whole series of new play published books. Um, I think he maybe ended up doing a total of nine of them that have some of the most uh, important, impactful uh, playwrights of the 60s and the 70s. Um, and that was directly connected to work that was happening at the Guthrie um, with, you know, a whole incredible list of uh, wonderful dramaturgs, including uh, Mark Bly and other mm -hmm. folks. So there's, so there is this uh, history and established tradition of uh, dramaturgical practice inside of the department, except when I, uh, when I arrived, uh, it was not being taught. So it was still, there was a course on the books, but it was not necessarily being taught. And so my sort of five year process here has been trying to reintegrate and build up the mm -hmm. recognition of uh, the practice and the study. Uh, still working on it, still haven't figured <laughs> out all the bugs. It's still a great experiment, but I think it's, it's important and it's been exciting to to reinstate and one of the things that we're also trying to do is to go back um, and reclaim that history and understand uh, the roots and lineage of it and also understand why um, why was it shelved and yeah. what was that what was the history behind that I haven't quite discovered that yet so I haven't quite had the time to focus on that but it will be part of the ongoing reestablishment of dramaturgical practice in the department Beautiful. Thank you. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Crazy. And Telvin, you're teaching playwriting, and that is a relatively, I mean, that hasn't been around in the last few years. It's, yeah, no, it's been, oh, you yeah. know, it's a, it's a course, and I mean, there, and uh, Kira Oblinsky has been teaching it, hmm. uh, and then other folks have been sort of guests. Uh, playwriting instructors. You know, I mean, it's interesting. This becomes a, a greater conversation, but there are these different classes that are taught, um, you know, but you really wonder, what. but how are they sequenced, right? Mm -hmm. what, what, what are they connected to? And then how do we really think about how they fit inside of our curriculum, not just as a, you know, intro to playwriting, advanced playwriting, but really, uh, how do they expand uh, one's understanding of dramaturgy, text analysis, directing, you know, how do they integrate and relate with performance? Um, so I think, you know, there are just some of those ongoing ideas that I think we need to continue to develop, especially for, I'm going to call them those outlier. They're not performance-based, right? They're not technically based, but those sort of outlier ideas that fit into um, theatrical practice. Um, so, so yeah, that's, those are my, those are my two fall courses, intro to playwriting and uh, dramaturgy. Wow. What a, yeah. Exciting. Great. Yeah. I want to see. Well, I, I live the practice. So that's the idea. <laughs> and most of my teaching is really related to, uh, you know, the way I approach uh, my professional career. I want to see like a crossover of those classes, just like, that'd be super cool. Yeah. <laughs> just one, yeah. one class period, everyone's going off, having fun. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you mentioned too, Telvin, in I think a peers meeting that you really like to have a 
your own um, work and teaching balance. Um, mm -hmm. Is that, could you say more about that philosophy and kind of how that um, works? Well, there, you know, there, there are two things that connect to it. One, I really like to bring in my professional practice inside of uh, the teaching process. Um, and so, especially inside of the dramaturgy course, there is a module where um, I work to connect the, the dramaturgs in the class with uh, a professional work that I'm developing at that time and that oh. they are working in real time and they're interviewing artists and they're uh, providing deliverables for that process. And, uh, oh. you know, this is, I guess this is year three, so I'm just the third year into teaching it. But both years, um, the dramaturgs have been able to work with folks like Camille Brown and... Uh, um, Harrison Rivers and another wonderful colleague of mine, um, Baba Israel. There are folks who worked on uh, Death of Salesman project that I did with Marion Elliott um, in London that premiered at the Young Vic. Um, you know, so there's there's this wonderful way of blending and really think I was working on a, uh, I've continued to work on an adaptation of Pal Joey uh, with a group of artists that go back and forth, but that's been two years in the development. Uh, so there's been a team that has worked on that. And, you know, one of the, the real breakthroughs is I had a group I was working on the stage adaptation of uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates' the, Between the World and Me, which premiered uh, at the the Apollo a couple of years back. And so we were in the, uh, and I was the dramaturg and dramaturg collaborator with Lauren Whitehead, who was the adapter, and Camilla Forbes, who's the executive producer of the Apollo, uh, was the director. And so I was able to utilize one of my dramaturgy teams. This is when it was just a BAM. So it wow. was the BA mentoring uh, course in dramaturgy, which was my first way of introducing it. So I had this great team working on that project because I was heading to uh, the Sundance uh, Theater uh, program and they were giving us a development, developmental uh, process for that work. And so my dramaturgs were the dramaturgy team uh, for that work. So I arrived uh, at, at, at the Sundance retreat and there on the table were all the deliverables from my uh, students and they were working directly in that particular process because we were adapting the work. Um, and then Matt Boris was hired by the Apollo to create the first uh, adapted script based on the redactions that uh, we had been developing and uh, and the whole team got a credit in the playbill at the Apollo. And so Holy that was sort of, that was one of my exciting, you know, direct and Camilla Force was so wonderful. She met with them every Monday for four weeks um, because we were in process and she really directly needed the type of support and research that they were doing in order to think about how we were going to adapt that text for the stage. Um, so that's, you know, not all artists are that accessible <laughs> and available, right? But so that's why that particular project is, you know, is one of my best examples because she made herself available for that whole period because um, the process really relied on the deliverable research um, that the team was doing at the time. So it was really very exciting. Wow, I had no idea Matt got hired by the Apollo. That's what an incredible opportunity. He got paid. <laughs> Holy smokes. <laughs> so, you know, that's, you know, that doesn't always happen, but that was one, that was a particular example. I mean, because we were, we had, uh, we had gotten to the end of our process and we had, constructed this text by splicing together different sections from the original and you know Lauren Whitehead was really working from these you know, we called them the redacted pages um, and so we needed someone to actually create a script and and Matt had already done this brilliant uh, breakdown of the entire text uh, sort of with all the sort of contextual information. I mean, it was just an ingenious document. Uh, and so they, so what I said, I said, well, you know, Matt Boris could do it. They were like, yes, hire him. 
And that's how wow. it happened. You know, it was really fantastic. Uh, I can't always guarantee that, but <laughs> that's my, that's my, 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 uh, my example of the possibility. Uh, right. so, so there's, you know, so that's the idea, you know, sort of the point for me is that at any given moment, uh, I'm navigating through some type of collaborative process or I'm in pre-production as a director or I'm working as a dramaturg for a particular project. I mean, example, I was working on and continue to work on uh, Ain't Misbehaving with Camille Brown. She was scheduled to, yeah. that was going to be a directorial debut last summer oh. at uh, Westport uh, Country Playhouse. And then it was going to go to uh, Barrington Stage. And so that has been postponed, but we're still okay. in process. So I was, I was engaged in the research and development of, uh, based on her exploration of the work. I mean, for those who know Ain't Misbehaving, I mean, basically it's, it's similar to a jukebox musical. There are five key characters based on the original players like Nell Carter and Armelia McQueen, who just lost, who just passed away a few weeks ago. And, um, and Andre De Shields was in that original cast and uh, Ken Page. So the characters are named after those artists. There's Nell, oh. there's Charlene Waters, so there's Charlene, so there's Ken Page, there's Ken, and there's Andre uh, and Armelia. And, you know, so, but, it, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, you know, it's Fats Waller lyrics and the way you can interpret them. There's a lot of misogyny and sexism and issues in sort of, the text itself, but even also the way it was stylized and staged. So uh, as Camille approaches it as an African-American woman choreographer director, you know, in, you know, 2020, 2019, it's like, well, what, what are the stories? What are we doing with this particular project? And so her first original, her initial instinct was to request a, uh, a way to uh, insert more dance. So she wanted to bring, she added five dancers. So there are five key mm -hmm. players and five dancers. So suddenly there's an ensemble of 10, which you can do a lot more with inside of the storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, and one of my big research breakthroughs was to go back and really look at the original material and understand the source. And so two of those great songs, Ain't Misbehaving and Black and Blue, originate from this uh, Broadway musical that Fats Waller and Andy Rasif developed, Andy Rasif being the lyricist, um, uh, uh, called Hot Chocolate. And it was uh, a musical that they were performing in Connie's Inn, which is run by gangsters, uh, led by Doug Schultz. And so Doug Schultz wanted to take the show to Broadway in order to make raise some money and this is, you know, this is in, you know, uh, 1929, sort of 30. Uh, and so that's why it's actually called Connie's Inn, Hot Chocolates on Broadway. But it's the first uh, uh, presentation, our first premiere of Ain't Misbehaving as a Song uh, and Black and Blue. And it's also the Broadway debut of uh, Louis Satchmo Armstrong. And he actually sings Ain't Misbehaving uh, from the pit uh, and has this sort of grand, you know, sort of stellar breakout performance. And so they repeat it all the time. So for us, which the, the actual, you know, Tony Award winning Broadway version of the play never acknowledges at all, well, we're much more excited about you know, the hot chocolates and the original sources. And, and also, you know, uh, Camille can be really, you know, sort of uh, uh, prodding in this, sort of this investigation. So she really wanted to understand the song Black and Blue and its connection to blackface and, you know, sort of the, it's, it's sung in one particular way, but she wanted to turn that on its head. And then I find out that the original reason why the song exists and the way they present it is that the gangster uh, wanted a blackface number in their production, which the artist didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. So they try to flip it on its head. So they stage black and blue in this elegant uh, bedroom 
with this gorgeous woman in a satin gown on satin sheets uh, with blackface. Mm -hmm. So she's already singing the song with this irony on um, this darkness. She's not doing it like a minstrel number. She's doing it like this, you know, sort of jazz lament. So they're already aware of how they're, you know, breaking down and defying this concept. So they do what they're told, but they do it in a very, uh, a, you know, insidious way, which is becomes very controversial, but it's also a big hit. And so we suddenly go, ah, there's something to dig into. What does that even mean to investigate and to understand how they're trying to subvert the impact of that type of integration? So for me, that's dramaturgy at its best. You know, <laughs> that's the core of what we're looking at to interpret, which then gives us license to um, think about what that means and what is underneath that song for a contemporary audience. Um, so that's, you know, so that's where it all starts to merge and to blend. So in my class last year, uh, there was a student who worked on Ain't Misbehaving in collaboration with me and made some wonderful, wonderful discoveries of, of research and ways of, it, of, of, of interpreting the original songs. So, you know, the only, and, and, the, and the final thing I will say on that is that is in many ways for me, uh, what uh, supports me as a professor, as a scholar, that I have to be able to continue the engaged professional practice inside of an understanding of the scholarship and the teaching, uh, which really makes me a full presence. Uh, I can't do one without the other. Right, mm -hmm. it's sort of how I see uh, my embodied teaching practice connected to my professional mm -hmm. practice. Um, and so, and that I'm purposeful in bringing that into the classroom. And so they're never separate for me, even you know, when I'm directing over at Penumbra, I'm really wanting you know, the students to understand what the work is happening here. Um, so they 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 always in many ways they always uh, work hand in hand. Wow! And what a what an incredible oppor opportunity again um, for for everyone taking your class as a student to be immersed in the work that you're doing. That's really just so incredible. Just thank you for yeah. Yeah, okay. thank you. Okay. On behalf of everyone. <laughs> or the, on the other side of that is, well, I ain't got nothing else, so that's what I'm using. <laughs> <laughs> Which is only half true, but it's partially true. <laughs> Man, um, okay, Telvin, I have a question. This is coming from Hunter. Hi, Hunter. And Hey, Hunter. <laughs> and she wants to know, okay, so you've worked with some really incredible artists and just have the ability to do some crazy name drops. And so she's wondering if you have like a, a really super, like what's your best name drop um, of someone that you've worked with? <laughs> that's a good question. No, that's a great question. I would love to know that. Oh, well, I do have a best name drop, but I'm not sure you all will know this name drop, but it's, it, you should know. Uh, I, I had the great honor of writing a collaborative piece with Carmen de Lavalade. Carmen de Lavalade is a legend, a legendary dancer, choreographer. Uh, you know, she, her origin story, she starts as a dancer with the Lester Horton Company in L.A. Uh, she's part of... Uh, 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 Carmen Jones uh, with Dorothy Dandridge. Uh, she's pals with Alvin Ailey. In fact, she dry, drags Alvin Ailey to the Lester Horton Company. So they become great buddies. Uh, they get sent to New York. And so they uh, make their Broadway debut in House of Flowers with Pearl Bailey. Uh, and that's where she meets her husband, Jeffrey Holder. And they get married and they become this incredible duo and he's a brilliant artist for those who don't know in the james bond 
movies he appears and he's also he was the ad campaign guy for seven up the uncola man and uh <laughs> you know but he was also the, the director and uh choreographer and costume designer for the Wiz. Uh, Tony Orr winning director and, you know, amazing choreographer with, uh, you know, Dance Theater of Harlem. And he also directed Kurtha Kit in Kismet uh, called Timbuktu. That was the translation. So, uh, so, so Carmen de la Vallad, uh legend, uh, lifetime. She won, you know, she got a Kennedy Award, Honors Awards. She was honored by the Kennedy <laughs> Center Awards. Uh, two years ago, so I got to go to the Kennedy Center Honors uh, mm -hmm. and to be there. Uh, but I created a piece with her called uh, As I Remember It, which was a solo performance piece that we toured uh, a few years ago that traveled around the country. Uh, and she calls me Bright Eyes and I call her uh, at least every month or every other week. And uh, she's in her late 80s at this present moment and remains fabulous. And we developed a piece. Uh, I called it my afternoon teas with Carmen and I would go and visit her in her incredible loft and she would tell me all of these wonderful stories about her life and about being in the Ed Sullivan show, about being in movies with Harry Belafonte and talk about name dropper. She's the quintessential name dropper. And then she also had this incredible decade uh, at Yale Repertory uh, Theater at the Yale Drama School, uh, 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 Bruce Sting brought her in to teach movement to dance, and she was there uh, teaching movement and also acting with uh, Meryl Streep and Sigourney Weaver and uh, Christopher Lloyd and that whole era and generation of artists. So at the premiere of our piece, as I remember it, Meryl Streep came and delivered flowers to her and did a bow to the master, you know. So she's just had this incredible decades long career. Uh, so for me to be able to collaborate with her and to be this collaborative writer and dramaturg to tell her story, I'd say is truly uh, a highlight of my life and career and that um, I consider her a mentor and a dear, dear, dear friend and that she remains in my life and that we're still continuing to think about sort of making work. She always calls me and so what am I doing? What am I doing now? I must you know, continue my career. Uh, so yeah, she's just, just remarkable. And uh, it was just an honor to be able to, and you know, I knew her and seen her work, uh, but to be able to, to work with her um, and to be immersed in that history and to learn so much, um, you know, and she's just, gracious and generous um, and supportive and still a pioneer, you know, with Dance Theater of Harlem and the commitment to, you know, she was the second prima ballerina at the Met. Her, the first was her cousin, Janet Collins. And so these are, you know, just legendary breakthrough, groundbreaking women of color um, you know, inside of, you know, she worked with Agnes DeMille and you know, Martha Graham, I mean, she just has this incredible legacy in dance and in theater. And in, and in film, she was in Lone Star. She, she's got uh, a, n quite a number of film credits as well. So just a remarkable artist and uh, to be able to uh, have that opportunity. I think for me, although I have to explain who she is, because, you know, many people may not know, but that's 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 about the biggest name I can drop. That's pretty pretty wonderful for me. Wow, that's impressive. Or to me, not necessarily for me. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So and and hopefully you would appreciate that, Hunter. And if you don't know Carmen de la Vallad, you should know, and the whole <laughs> dance program should know who she is. <laughs> so there we are. You know, also you know, incredible. Uh, solo performance career with legendary choreographers like John Butler. Um, so, you know, just, just amazing. We, I consider her for a period of time. She was, uh, she was a, a collaborative muse for many choreographers who, who, who built work for her. 
Um, yeah, international and international sensation. Yep. Wow. So, so that's my that's my big name drop. <laughs> <laughs> that's insane. And like twenty seven sequential name drops, like stemming from that. That was exactly. that was beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> a whole tree. Yeah, a whole tree. A whole tree. Wow. You know, and that's just from being in the being in the room, right? Mm. Being in the room. You know, there was a, a commission coming from an art company called 651 Arts, a wonderful, Anna Glass was working there, who's now the executive director at uh, Dance Theater of Harlem. And they wanted, you know, it was, it was actually for a benefit. They wanted Carmen to tell her life story for a benefit. And they commissioned me to uh, be her collaborative writer. And then it all sort of built from there. You know, so it's just that uh, that idea of, you know, being at the right place at the right time. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. And so speaking of, well, place and time, I guess not necessarily the right place, right time, but it is, so it's not quite today yet, but this episode will drop on election day. Oh. Yes. <laughs> and so it, it seems like this is, a very charged moment, mm -hmm. um, a very important moment. And um, I guess we're just curious kind of what your thoughts are for, mm. for theater, for people, for everything kind of going forward. Well, one of, the, one of the things that's been amazing to me, and I, I will have to say, I, uh, unfortunately, I have five more minutes because I have uh, uh, my next, uh, I'm doing half hour sessions with my playwriting student for their midterms. And yes. so I have scheduled someone at 4.30, sorry. No, uh, no apologies, okay. no apologies. So I'll, 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 I'll drop this quickly. Um, in, in the past few weeks, I've been collecting uh, statements by folks around the importance of uh, of art in our life, and particularly of of, of theater and and culture, um, and you know, just a few weeks ago, um, the Mellon Foundation made a major contribution to uh, arts institutions of color, uh, large donations, and the Ford Foundation as well. Uh, made major grants to uh, institutions that they called uh, American Cultural Treasures. Uh, Penumbra was one of them, and they received a $2.5 million grant from the Ford Foundation from oh. that honor. Um, and so there just been, uh, there's a recent interview between Ava DuVernay and Angela Davis, in which Angela Davis says it really is through culture and art that we respond uh, to the critical crises of our everyday lives and that art is essential uh, in the battle uh, against um, those particular uh, challenges that we face, uh, white supremacy being one of them. Um, and um, I, uh, uh, Alexander, the poet, who's now the president of the Mellon Foundation. Elizabeth Alexander, thank you, there it is. Uh, I am getting a little old, but uh, also, you know, in a recent interview when she made the announcement, they made the announcement about the Mellon investigation to, in, to these institutions, she also acknowledged uh, that they're really looking to arts institutions and artists in particular uh, in guiding the way and leading us sort of out of our current crisis and climate. Um, so for me, uh, the fact that these incredible artists, activists, uh, women and women of color affirming the importance of art and culture uh, in addressing these systemic problems and issues uh, should give us all hope for why we are investing and committing uh, into these careers of art and performance. Um, they really are saying that these are the places where communities can come together to think about these greater ideas and these greater issues, and that they are vital uh, to the 
ongoing evolution and progress of a society. I mean, they're talking in big epic terms, right? Around performance, culture, and art. Um, so I think it's important that we don't lose sight of that uh, and that we also understand that that means in these critical moments that we must speak, right? We must create. Uh, our voices must be heard. Um, and that it's through uh, that action, that act, because they also are talking of, they are talking about art as action in all of those conversations of uh, that we really uh, can bring about change. Uh, and I don't think that's being Pollyanna-ish, Pollyanna if there is such a word, or, or, even, or even altruistic. I think it's just being factual. And I understand this, especially in the process and the practice that I'm doing, and I'm, most of the works and the projects that I'm committed to right now are navigating through history, whether it's you know, Red Summer and sort of kind of racist vigilante mob violence and lynching that occurred during that year, sort of the most violent year in the history uh, of white mobs uh, uh, attacking black citizens, uh, known and documented, sort of the history of that, also understanding the Tulsa, Oklahoma race riots, also the work that I've been doing uh, with uh, the stories telling around the killing of Emmett Till and how that remains very present inside of our psyche and understanding um, that art becomes a place where we continue to understand and tell these stories inside of our current culture and find a way for people to actually appreciate them and wrestle with these sort of very hard um, challenges. Um, the very last play that I directed, um, uh, completed, able to complete um, mm -hmm. before the pandemic was the white card at Penumbra. Um, and the continuing challenge and navigation around the issues that that play presents remains quite vibrant um, in the Twin Cities. Even to this moment, people still bring it up and, and talk about it. So I understand that the work that we do and the work that we can consider um, remains very palpable uh, in the task of bringing about the change in our society that we need to bring about. So for me, hearing this, being able to say that on this day, uh, I really hope that whatever the turnout is, that we remain true to the cause and we will be challenged to continue um, to fight these battles because clearly voter disenfranchisement is not going away anytime soon. And the way that we are manipulated inside of uh, a, a democracy that is supposed to be committed to all citizens and their right to vote and the way that that is denied and manipulated uh, really uh, challenges our understanding of this nation as a democracy. Um, and I think the outcome from this, whatever that outcome may be, uh, will still remain in the shadow of the vicious, malicious voter disenfranchisement that has occurred and continues to occur, occur in our culture. And we have to continue to address it and fight it. Uh, and we have to know and understand <laughs> that midterm elections are just as important as <laughs> presidential elections. And we really do need to keep those fires going. So mm -hmm. this is not an, an ending of this moment. I think this is a continued call and charge uh, to all of us to stay the course and remain committed to the way our art and artistry can address the challenges of our lives. And I will end with that. Lovely. All right, well, thank you so much, Talvin. Thank you. That was super fun. <laughs> I, and I just wanna commend you all. This is, as far as I'm concerned, the most brilliant idea uh, that is occurring in our department. And it is mm. occurring because <laughs> of peers and the reps and you are charging and leading the way and I am honored to be in your presence oh. oh gosh it's totally likewise right right yeah i was like what <laughs>
<laughs> and it's true. It's true. Uh, that's why I'm here today and, and, and speaking to you. So thank you. Thank you for considering me worthy of oh, the honor. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And thank you for all of your time today. And I hope your um, playwright one-on-ones go well today. Go well. Mm -hmm. okay, well, I'm sure Raymond is waiting for me. Got to go. Yes, okay. Go. All right. Hey, Raymond. <laughs> Hi, Raymond. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Ah, that was so good. That was so wow. fun. I just sat there and I was like, we're being educated. And I was like, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. That his last, his kind of final few minutes, I was like, mm -hmm. that's why, like, that's why theater. Yeah. 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 All right. Now, time for our panoramic, segoramic, wild ramic trauma llama 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 segaramas <laughs> segments there we are our segments are. for the day um our artist profile today is lou bellamy uh lou bellamy is the founder and co-artistic director of penumbra theater company in st paul minnesota during his 39 year tenure penumbra has evolved into one of america's premier theaters dedicated to dram dramatic exploration of the african-american experience under his leadership, Penumbra has grown to be the largest theater of its kind in America and has produced 39 world premieres, including August Wilson's first professional production. Uh, Penumbra is proud to have produced more of Mr. Wilson's plays than any other theater in the world. Uh, Mr. Bellamy is an Obie Award-winning director and accomplished actor, and for 38 years was appointed as associate professor at the University of Minnesota in, in UMTAD. Um, directing credits include plays at Arizona Theater Company, Denver Theater Center for the Performing Arts, Penumbra Theater, uh, Signature Theater, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, the Cleveland Playhouse, Indiana Repertory Theater, the Guthrie Theater, the Kennedy Center, and Hartford Stage Company. Um, you, he's also a UMNM alumni, has an MA in theater um, in 1978. And Penumbra Theater creates professional productions that are artistically excellent, thought-provoking, and relevant, and illuminates the human condition through the prism of the African-American experience, which is their mission statement. Oh, there you are. Beautiful. And Telvin does a lot of work at Penumbra, too, so it felt perfect to highlight the artistic director, who is uh, retired now, but legendary here in the Twin Cities. And for our student feature of the week, we have the beautiful Emmeline from the fourth year BFA company. And she is here to tell you about her um, TAD journey and also the fact that she is actually, I can't spoil it. I can't spoil it. Emmeline, take it away. Hi, I'm Emmeline Chu. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a fourth year student in the UMN Guthrie Theater BFA Actress Training Program here at UMTAD. Um, and my major interests with it, um, Tad, are really anything acting related. Um, I specifically love exploring voice. I love doing scene work, but exploring all the different possibilities that you can create with your voice and all the different places you can go with that and access these places within yourself is really cool. So, um, those are my favorite classes are always voice and speech. Um, my favorite class at the U, in the department was uh, the Roy Hart class with Lucinda Holshue because that class just did exactly that. It allowed me to access so many different parts of my voice and go places vocally that I had never explored before and to get to see that in my company members and in my peers who I've known for quite a few years was really special. Um, I'm currently working on a short film, which is set to film this winter, actually. I wrote the screenplay for it, and it will be directed by the amazing Erica Huang, who's my dear friend and just a overall wonderful person. I trust her with my life, and I trust my script with her life. I trust my script, I trust my script with whatever. <laughs> um... um what was I saying? Uh, the film is called Mudflower. It's a short story about two young women working in 
the retail industry working in a clothing shop on Christmas Eve, which is an attempt at highlighting the conflict and contrast between spirituality and materialism. Not necessarily religion, but just uh, the idea of something being spiritual and holy and something more than just a material concrete thing that you can just reach out and touch. And um, the story explores consumerism and customer service and what it means to see beyond yourself and do something for another person. And that is set to film this December. Uh, We're currently raising money for it. We have a GoFundMe. Um, We are so close to reaching our goal, but we still have $2,000 more to raise. So if anyone is interested in donating to that, that would be so, so appreciated. And anyone who donates $20 or more is gifted a cultural cookbook, which is compiled by the cast and crew of Mudflower. So that's something really special that we compiled as a gift to our donors. And yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you, Emmeline. Popping off as usual. So we now have a question for y'all. Mm-hmm. Where did you wear your I voted sticker, you know? Mm -hmm. Because at this point, you would have voted, yeah? Right. Yeah? Because I told you you didn't, and you could. I would fight you. And then you you wouldn't be listening to this podcast because you couldn't listen to the podcast until you read. I did say that. I did say that. (laughs) I said a lot of things. So where did you put that sticker, though? Because that's the most important part of voting. (laughs) Right, and now there's an opportunity to put it right on your mask and show mm. the whole world to see. When exactly. You do, yeah. Mm-hmm. I also really like. I don't know if you see those who already voted would have saw the uh, I voted early stickers. Those really pop off. Yeah. Those really pop off. They're I have cute. to say, I really like those. Yeah. But this is the time. If you have not voted, vote. I understand that this podcast comes out on Tuesday, voting day at like twelve. So, <laughs> you know. You still have time today, so I suggest what you do is you put on your AirPods or your your Beats or your, you know, whatever headphones you have, and you start walking to your polling place wearing your mask and your face shield because we're being, <laughs> we're being, you know, smart, and you go vote. So make sure you're doing that. For sure. And while you're at it, if you pass Target or Boynton or anywhere, go ahead and get that flu shot too, because Mm. it is very, it's so important this year. And I feel like getting a flu shot for me, it's really hard for me because I hate needles, but (laughs) it feels so much better to know that if I do get sick, it won't be a confusion of, oh, is it the flu or is it COVID? I'll know it's COVID. So hopefully it won't happen. (laughs) (laughs) But it'll take on so much confusion for you. So Go yes. ahead and get that flu shot. Do it for the what, herd. What solace that is that gives you right there. Right. <laughs> I absolutely love that. All right. And at the end of the day, y'all, remember that you all are so loved. You're wonderful human beings. No matter what happens after this um, election. And just know you're still loved by us, by this department, by, you know, the folks around you. The folks, you know, that, that, that brought you to where you are today and the folks that will continue to bring you into different places that you're going. You're so loved. You deserve to be here in this planet and this space and this, and this everything. So just remember that at the end of the day, we still got you and, you know, you're loved. And now, last but not least, we have some great, great, great wise words from the Kira Ron. <laughs> hey y'all. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for everything that you do and the gift that you are to everyone around you. You are so, so loved. And nothing will change that ever. Not even anything that happens tonight or in the next week or the coming weeks. Just remember, please. And thank you that you are so loved. And I really, truly think that the best way to feel that love is to give it to others. I mean, it's such an old age adage, but it's so true. Um, Give to others what you would give to you. And 
you know, one of my favorite ways to do that is the mask smile, right? You're walking down the street and you see, you make eye contact with someone and do the little squinty eye thing. And you can just tell, you can't see their face completely, but you can just tell that other person is smiling. And it's so, so brightening, you know? And actually I was in my car the other day at a stoplight and the woman next to me, we made eye contact and she, she mouthed, um, I love your hair. And so we rolled down our windows and we were chatting for, you know, just the 10 seconds or whatever. And just, it's little things, it's little things. And so thank you. You are so loved. Be kind to you, be kind to others. And so to close the sounds, I have the best wiggling, dancing, brightening song I could think of. It's called Be Kind to Me by Langhorn Slim. And it's it's a good one. Check it out, y'all. <laughs> This episode of The PureCast is edited by Rachel Breeze, programmed by Hunter Batterson and Caitlin McLean, and our music is composed by Raymond New. I'm so... You got this. ...conscious today. Okay, well. You just gotta... You just gotta... One more, just for, just for the one more, just for the one time. <laughs> ma, ma. There it is, there it is, it's right there. It's okay, right there. great, beautiful. <clears throat> All right.